the businesses that do think about the whole person and think about the person beyond just when they clock in and clock out are the most successful businesses. They have the highest productivity rate, the lowest turnover, the best profitable margins. Welcome everybody to Navigate's People First podcast. Thank you all for joining us. Please continue to subscribe and like our podcast if we're bringing you value. Today is a special day for us. Um, this is a full circle moment for me, and I'd like to start out um, our podcast with a story. Um, this story begins um, in 1962, where a recent graduate of Nevada High School in Story County, Iowa, was working um, with his full heart and mind and body ready to join the Marines um, after graduation. Uh, this young man was working a summer job like most do um, when his life would change forever. Working in construction on a building, on a roof, uh, a tree fell, um, hit electric line, and then ended up hitting this young, uh, this young man at the hospital. Um, he lost his arm, his foot was burned on 80% of his body, um, and had a very long road to, uh, to recovery, disabled for the rest of his life. Fast forward a few years. Uh, today, that man, um, after a 35-year career at the Department of Transportation here in Iowa, um, having four boys, just celebrated his 60th wedding anniversary last Wednesday, and that individual was my father, Richard Vincent. And uh, so my dad taught me a lot of things about being disabled. My dad taught me a lot of things about the grind of getting things done. And uh, when I talk about a full circle, um, Senator Harkin um, is joining us today for our podcast. And the Vincent family is a big fan of yours. Senator Harkin's work within the ADA, within kids and food nutrition. Um, I still remember the day that I'm sitting with my dad watching television, making him making me sit and watch this. And it was uh, April, May of 1990. And there were about 10 to 15 people um, in wheelchairs um, right in front of the stairs at, at the Capitol building. Those folks were trying to get into the Capitol. They couldn't. And they couldn't because there weren't ramps, there weren't elevators, there weren't that built environment um, on the commercial side of things for the entry for them to get into our Capitol. So they got out of their wheelchairs and started to climb up the stairs. Um, the news would call it the next night, you know, the Capitol crawl. Our legislation of the ADA was written and put to forth because of Mr. Harkin, which in my mind was one of the most important civil rights laws in the United States history. I'm very proud that he is from Iowa and he was our senator. And I'm excited to introduce um, Senator Tom Harkin to join us today. And uh, Matt Reed, who's the executive director of the uh, Harkin Institute, where they're continually doing some wonderful work. But this is a man who sponsored the, the lead landmark ADA legislation, um, also within employment, transportation, public accommodations, communications, all those things. We think about the legislation um, that happened there and how they extended into folks like us looking at ways where we can have, build a more inclusive world, inclusive employer employees, um, inclusive communities. Gentlemen, um, welcome to the show, and uh, I'm excited to have you guys here. So thank you for uh, being with us today. Thank you. Well, Troy, thank you. That You didn't know that story. Thank you for telling me that story. That is very profound. Thank you. You've been an important person in, in, in our lives, um, just understanding disabilities. And from, I think about um, your brother, Frank, and the work that you did within even the Carter administration with uh, closed captioning. I mean, our young people are like, oh, we had closed captioning. Well, that came from work that you did back in the 70s around um, that. And so, uh, I'd love people to, to know your story. And so that's why we're here today. And we're going to talk about you, you maybe some past work and how you got started within uh, the work in the ADA. And then I'd love to get um, with Matt and talk about what you're doing within the Harkin Institute and how we're continuing your your pathway forward and, and doing some good. So so help the listeners maybe just um, what inspired you to, you know, obviously politics isn't easy, but what inspired you within your political world to really focus on those folks in, in in disability and and inclusion within your work in legislation well troy it was my older brother frank um 
uh, he um, became deaf at a young age, about five years old, when he had spinal meningitis. Now, he was quite a bit older than I was. And so um, they sent him halfway across the state to the Iowa School for the Deaf, which I learned later as I started growing up, and he was in high school there, that they called it the Iowa School for the Deaf and Dumb, hmm. which my brother Frank said one time to me, I may be deaf, but I'm not dumb. So uh, and I just watched how what happened to Frank. He, uh, when he finished, now, now things have changed, so it's not the same now as it was then, but when he finished the Iowa School for the Deaf, uh, they told him he could be three, one of three things. He could be a shoe cobbler, he could be a printer's assistant, or he could be a baker. Hmm. And they asked him which one he wanted to be. And he said, I, I don't want to be any of that. And they said, well, then you're a baker. Yeah. And, that, and that was, his, that was right. his option. So he became a baker. Later on, he got the job he liked in a, in a factory, in a plant here in West Des Moines, Iowa, as a matter of fact. But I just saw how he was kind of discriminated against all of his life because he was deaf. I could tell you a story after a story, but. And then my nephew, my sister's son, uh, joined the Navy, uh, was on an aircraft carrier, the Midway, and he was a, just a young high school kid out of high school. He was on the aircraft carrier, and, uh, and, uh, and one of the jets, it was an A-6, was, uh, the, the pilot inadvertently turned up the engine and shouldn't have. Mm. My nephew was crawling under the plane like he should have, and it was sucked, he was sucked down the jet intake. And it broke his neck. And so he became actually kind of almost quadriplegic, uh, although he could use his hands a little bit. No, he was 19 years old. Yeah. And, and his folks didn't have any money. And so I remember when I went out to visit them in Colorado, I mean, his father had to build a ramp, had to widen the doors for his wheelchair, change the bathrooms. And then we wanted to go out to eat one night have some Mexican food out and we were out in Colorado and he couldn't even get across the street, couldn't get in the restaurant. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, wait, there's more here to this than just hearing. There's physical disabilities. Later I met Danny Piper, a young man who went to Ankeny High School, acted in a play and someone, a friend of mine said, you should see this kid. He's got Down syndrome and he's the manager of the football team. He acts in plays. So I went to see this. So then I met his folks, met Danny, fascinating young man. Uh, and in those days, I used to do work days where I'd take a whole day and work on a job someplace. So I did a work day with Danny one time, stocking shelves. Later on, when I had my first hearings, the first hearing I had on the Americans with Disabilities Act, I had Danny Piper come testify. First time a person with Down syndrome had ever testified before a Senate committee. Well, so you ask how I got involved. That was my progress. And so in the 70s, when I was in the House, I was focused mostly on deafness. Mm -hmm. In fact, in 1978, uh, Senator Jennings Randolph of West Virginia and I, I'm in the House, delivered the first decoder, closed caption decoder to Jimmy Carter in the White House. Well, I used my status to get one for my brother, Frank. <laughs> so I got one for Frank. and. It was just like amazing. Now he could understand what things were happening on television. I, I'll never forget when we plugged it in, and 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 the first uh, the first show we watched was was called uh, was the Ed Sullivan Show Sunday nights. Yeah, because the that only was, one, that was a big deal then. That was, was a big deal. deal. Yeah, the only ones you could get that were closed captions channels uh, were, 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 <laughs> were programs that were pre recorded. Sure. They would send them to a place that I was involved in setting up called the National Captioning Institute in Alexandria, Virginia. And so they would caption it and then show it on TV later. And so uh, that's how I got involved with, with captioning and the uh, Captioning Institute. And then later on getting, passing the TV Decoder and Circuitry Act, which I'll bet you never heard of. I haven't heard of that one. A lot of people think of me only as the ADA. Right. I was the chief sponsor of. But before I passed the ADA, I passed another bill that I really did write. <laughs> now, the ADA, I can't say I'm the author. It's a lot of people. A lot of people were involved in this. I was the lead sponsor. I did take it through and got it, got it through. That's true. And I did have things that we didn't. But 
But the TV Decoder and Circuitry Act, I was that, that was yours. That was mine. <laughs> and what it did, it mandated that every television set sold in America, sold in America, that had a size 13 inch screen or bigger, had to have a decoding chip in the set to decode closed captions. And there yep. we are today. Look where we are today. Yeah. Amazing. Well, my wife thanks you for that because I turned the TV up way too loud and now it's on mute and I close caption when I'm watching a football game. So <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah. you're helping marriages throughout the world as well. So. And sport and sports bars too. Exactly. Sports bars too. <laughs> yeah. I know folks think of you as the American Disability Act, which is definitely, you know, um, out there. But other things I think that one of the things I, I think about you is the prevention side. Um, when I think about your work in preventive health and the National Institute of Health and that work, you really steered prevention to the top of the conversation. Right. Um, how in our daily work every single day at Navigate, we're trying to think about how we can get folks to think about prevention and thinking about getting to their doctor and, and thinking about their, their healthy journey. And so, you know, when you thought about prevention, how did that evolve? And then um, where did you see that prevention adding into on the overall health side of things? Well, I, I, can, I don't know that I can pinpoint exactly, but as the 80s evolved and I went from the House to the Senate and then got on the Senate Health Committee, um, I began to have different friends of mine who had a different approach to medicine. Uh, one of those was a former congressman from Iowa by the name of Berkeley Bedell. He and I came to Congress together. He represented Northwest Iowa. I represented Southwest Iowa. And uh, he'd come down with the kind of cancer and, and he took some different kinds of procedures to it. And he became more involved in prevention and got me interested in it. And, and then I began to broaden my circle of people that I met and talked to in the medical community. And I remember once, and I don't know who this was, Troy, someone said something that has stuck with me ever since. Um, in America, uh, we don't have a health care system. We have a sick care system. If you're sick, you get care. But what is there out there to keep you healthy? Nothing. Uh, and yet we know that prevention and wellness not only saves lives, make people well, it saves a lot of money, but we put everything into patching, fixing, mending, a pill, a cure, something. Now, again, we've made great progress. I'm not denying that we haven't done magnificent things in curative uh, medicine. But when it comes to keeping you healthy, we're one of the worst countries in the world. And so that's what I started. I wanted to start to start getting people to think about prevention and incorporating it. And so in 1989, I was in charge of fund. I was I had the appropriations subcommittee that funded the Center for Disease Control. And so I just wrote in Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And so I just added the word. You can do that. Well, I could. I, the, I did. <laughs> but there's a little funny story here to this. <laughs> so I did that. But the CDC people, uh, they didn't like that. They wanted to keep it CDC, uh, the logo CDC. And one of the things was they, they raised the point that if you look in English, if C, D, C, P, um, they didn't like that. They, they just, that didn't matter. So we struck a compromise. They can keep the logo, but the official name is the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Well, then after that, I began to do more funding through my subcommittee and focusing on prevention and wellness. Uh, and to get the CDC focused on that and on public health, uh, putting more money into the broad public health regime in, in America. So that's that's sort of how that started. When we think about um, progress, we're getting there, right? Matt, you're in charge of this wonderful institution that um, that uh, Senator Harkin has at Drake University. We recently you recently had um, Surgeon General uh, Murphy there. And I, the, one of the quotes that I just, it just stuck with me while, while we were visiting, he said, Troy, a healthy workforce is a foundation of thriving organizations and healthier communities. And we have to think of it that way where our businesses are leading our communities and we need to deconstruct that. When you think about the voice that now you're 
progressing forward from Senator Harkin and the work you guys are doing. Tell me a little bit about, you know, the Institute and let people know what you guys are doing there and, and what you're focusing on these days. Sure. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's my privilege to be the executive director of the Harkin Institute, which is a, a responsibility I, I take seriously. We've got this wonderful legacy. I'm standing next to the man right now um, of inclusion and trying to find ways to con continue the work of, of creating a more inclusive society, whether that's through our work on labor and employment, wellness and nutrition, retirement security, or people with disabilities. Um, in terms of the the Surgeon General's visit and what he was talking about. Um, I had never met the Surgeon General before he came. He's a very calm, calming speaker. He is. He is a very there calming were tears speaker. Yeah. As he spoke, you yeah. could see people tearing up. And it was about sort of civil connection and the connection between people and how, particularly among young people, they become more isolated, partially due to social media. I think there are other issues as well. And it, it took me back to my previous sort of career. I used to work in community colleges throughout the Northeast uh, as an administrator. And in 2019, at my previous school, so pre-COVID, we did a survey on campus to find out from students, um, what's the, the biggest obstacle that you face finishing your degree? And I was expecting them to say something like tuition or transportation or medical issue. The number one issue was anxiety. Mm. And this is pre-COVID. It's getting worse. Hmm. Um, and so what, what we're looking at are, are ways to encourage um, connection among people and involvement, because we know that sitting alone on, on, on the couch with your phone, sort of doom scrolling uh, blue sky or Twitter or whatever, is not going to help. That what you need is connection with other people and preferably purposeful connection. So the full name of the Harkin Institute is actually the Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Civic Engagement. We try to engage people, particularly young people, um, in active work towards a more inclusive future. So whether that's through public programming, whether that's through internships, um, we have a wonderful crop of interns at the, at the Institute, um, whether it's through political involvement, we're nonpartisan, but we do encourage uh, folks to vote. Uh, we want to make sure that people get off the couch and get involved in the community in one way or another, because really you, you're not going to get over your isolation by yourself. That just doesn't work. You know, that was one of the things I think that you talk about progress, Senator Harkin, is it seems to me that we've been emphasizing the need to um, reduce the stigma around mental health, and we're getting there. Um, in our work every day, you know, we're, we're helping people promote access to mental health services, being able to integrate mental health into you know, um, their well-being program at their employer group, but then also into their primary care. Um, one of our, our favorite clients is a, is a, uh, a car manufacturer, um, in, uh, in the South Carolina area and through their clinics on site, they have two mental health counselors there at all times. And it's wonderful. They're, 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 you know, they're at hundred percent capacity. Folks are visiting with them and we're really negating that stigma. We're providing access and we're talking about a demographic that's 90% male. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's a, that's a, that's a win. Um, oh. uh, it's an exponential win just based on that. But when we think about the work that you've done inside schools, when it comes to kids nutrition, right. Um, talk to me about how you're connecting those dots, because again, we start thinking about a strong community, um, is about the public health side of things. So it's just not businesses. It's just not, um, you know, uh, our health systems, it's our schools as well. And those, and, the, and those kids that are in there every single day. Talk to me a little bit about the work that you did there. Well, Troy, I don't know how many years it took, probably more than 10, 12 years, maybe of, of just constant work, not just by me, but others I worked with to get sugar drinks out of schools. I took, I couldn't believe it. I mean, we fought it and we fought it and we fought it year after year. Finally got it done. But what a struggle just to get Pepsi and Coke, well, sugar, all sugar drinks out of high school vending machines and stuff like that. Uh, now, again, the compromise, fine, okay. They could have it on the football field or the basketball court or something after school, but not during school. So we got our, we got, we got that done. And then we started moving towards more healthy choices for students in high school. 
And so, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember when I did this back in the 2000 something about uh, providing uh, funds for the National uh, School Nutrition Program, the school lunch program, to set up salad bars and uh, choices for students other than just whatever they put on your tray, you now could get fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, things like that. And I think that's pretty much true in most schools today. They, they do have that, that option. Uh, the third thing was focusing on elementary schools and getting kids started correctly. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, as well as I do, I mean, that, that, that if, 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 if kids start out eating certain foods and they develop a taste for those foods, that sticks with them. So if they start eating candy and sweets and things like that and early, that sticks with them. Of course, we all have a inward addiction to candy. I think that say we don't, but uh, the idea was to start getting kids in elementary school fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, so I started in the two in two thousand two in the Farm Bill when I was chair. I started a small program in five states. Uh, to provide free fresh fruits and vegetables to kids. Actually, it was in elementary and high school uh, as a snack in the morning where they could just, not in the lunchroom, but in a kiosk or in the hall or even uh, even sitting at their desk. Well, that started in 2003 and we had some problems and we worked them all out. And then finally in 2008, I'm back as chairman again. And I took the program and made it a national program. So now we have a national free fresh fruit and vegetable program. One thing we learned is we, uh, because of, uh, uh, just because of the money involved, uh, we had to, we, and, and, and it wasn't working that well in high school. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, that's the price. <laughs> we we, we got to focus on elementary. Yeah. So, so we cut out the high school. So now it's just elementary school. So elementary schools all over America today, get uh, free fresh fruits and vegetables for kids that they can eat at their desk, that they can have at a kiosk in the hallway, wherever. Sometimes I've even seen buses uh, that the bus drivers will have snacks for the kids like that when they pick them up in the morning, take them to school, take them home in the afternoon. So they, and, and, and I watched this whole thing develop. And Dole, Dole, uh, not Senator Dole, but Dole, you know, Dole, the company. Yeah, Dole. sure. They latched onto this and started doing some interesting things. In the beginning, uh, you could get an apple. But, but then Dole figured out a way of slicing the apples and putting them in a package, I think with nitrogen or some inert gas, and they don't, get, they don't turn brown. So now you get apple slices. Yeah. Makes it easier. Second thing Dole did is they took pineapples and they put pineapples in these little plastic uh, kind of things and the kids can eat them like a popsicle now brilliant so the food companies adapted to this in many different ways of, of getting these fresh fruits and vegetables to the kids so I, that program i'm very proud of because it's all over america now it really is and it, it's evolved to different avenues too i mean you walk into the wonderful places like a hy food stores and there's there's smaller areas where it's just fresh um, stuff for us, at, uh, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables that are easy, packageable, taking them to the kids, putting them in our, our lunch kits and stuff like that. But then also to convenience stores. Um, that's, that's the evolution that I love seeing too, where you look at a Casey's, you look at, you know, come and goes, you look at those places. I'm going to throw Bucky's in there as well in the great state of Texas and like all the fresh and thing, every freshness that they have around, you know, eating healthy at, at the, at the gas stations, the convenience stores. That's another evolution of the progress that was made, I believe, in that environment, that ecosystem that that uh, trying to just progress better eating, better better um, opportunity to have that food. Um, what I also love about that too is you think about our food deserts that are in the rural communities that we serve, having that fresh fruit in those convenience stores might be one of the only places they can have fresh food for, for adults and kids in those areas. So the other thing I want to mention, Troy, in case you don't bring it up is that the other thing I got involved in a long time ago was, um, mental health for kids in elementary school. And a program started here in Des Moines. It was called smoother sailing. And I got 
some of your tax dollars to fund it. Uh, and also, uh, I just lost the company that, that they also, uh, I want to say it was Microsoft, but it could have been Google. It's either Google or Microsoft. One of those tech, one of those tech, one of those big, one of those big, they sure. put money in. <laughs> and it was a test program that we had for a few years here in Des Moines in which we had a qualified counselor, a child health specialist counselor in, in health, mental health, who would be in the school with kids all day long. Mm. What this person would do is if a kid was having a problem or something, they would meet with them, talk to them. They would go home with them and help them at home to set up a study space with their parents. They would actually go out to the houses brilliant. with these brilliant. And what we found was the number of, uh, of vagrancies went way down. The number of altercations and fights in schools between kids went way down. Kids' test scores went up. It just proved the value of having someone there uh, on site. And, and the other thing, I visited a couple of these schools where we had these counselors. And the counselors would stand outside the school in the morning when the kids showed up. So the kids would know that person was there yeah. during the day. for Positive the, impact when they first walk in the door. Very positive impact. But you know what? <laughs> and we've never been able to get it nationwide. Uh, to me, it's just, uh, again, one of those unmet needs that we have in our school systems today. Matt, we got work to do. We do? Yes. <laughs> Senator Harkin, you know, behind your back, we call you the, um, the champion of the whole person. Um, that's what, that's what we, we think of you when you think about healthcare, we think about disability rights, the built environment, kids in schools, wellness and labor. Um, that whole person is, you've been championing that for decades. And I thought it might be interesting for you to know that we had, we had a, uh, a wonderful event, um, yesterday with about 300 of our clients, a, a webinar about some new things that we we're progressing forward. And in the survey that we did, um, 55% of these are HR professionals throughout the country that are helping their employees toward a healthier lifestyle. 55% of those folks said their number one priority is the whole person and how we can help them with their health and well being. So, focusing on the whole person. That wasn't the way it was 15 years ago. And so, that progress, uh, again, we've got work to do. But when we think about that whole person and championing that, um, you've unleashed some, some thought process around, you know, connecting the dots of that whole person and into the community and to someone's purpose. And, um, it's just been, it's been great, um, to be able to have a champion here in the state of Iowa to, to do that. And I think about things like your project uplift, mm -hmm. um, Matt, you want me to talk about project uplift? I love what you guys are doing there. You want to maybe chat that, sure. about that a little bit. Sure. Project uplift, um, is a. We're hosting at the Harkin Institute. It's, it's not technically one of our pillars. It's a basic income project uh, that provides $500 a month for 24 months to 110 low-income families in central Iowa, evenly divided among urban, suburban, and rural. The idea is to see what happens in terms of child health, school attendance, uh, occupational success, educational attainment, when families have a little bit of extra breathing room financially and the stories they told were so real just so utterly easy to picture and just very concrete that you really you got the point immediately one of them mentioned for example and I, i'm not going to use names because i forgot them <laughs> uh, she mentioned that she was able to use the money to reduce her hours at work so she could get a certificate from the local community college to get a better job she got the certificate, she got the better job, and now she's more materially secure. That's positive well-being. Yeah. That's huge. You know, if, if you can solidify families, that's huge and cheap at the price. Senator Harkin, your funding of research when it comes to um, uh, public health in general, um, genomics being one of them, and how you kind of progress that forward. As we look at cancer today in our state in Iowa increasing um, throughout the country within our employer groups and the claims associated with that. Cancer is getting in the top, you know, five claims across our country. When you think about increased funding and securing funding for research around diseases like cancer and diabetes, you've done that once. 
how, how are you seeing um, the Harkin Institute maybe progressing that forward? And we've got, again, we got more work to do. So how, how do you see that and maybe background and where you see that maybe progressing forward? Well, interestingly enough, uh, uh, just as we sit here, uh, uh, in the next couple of days, we're sponsoring a two-day conference on the health impacts of uh, what we call confined animal feeding operations or these large integrated, uh, uh, these large uh, animal things where they have you know, 100,000 chickens and 50,000 hogs and 50,000 cow or cattle and that. And, and, and there's been a lot of studies done on the health impacts of that. And so we're having a two-day conference uh, with Johns Hopkins University. Um, they've just published a book. And, and so this book is coming out at our conference. And it's a book of different chapters that written by epidemiologists and others who have studied this and uh, showing the, the close connection between not only increased cancers, but respiratory problems, bronchitis, allergies, different things like that in the vicinity and around the areas of these large animal feeding operations, not to mention the residual health impacts of the water and how bad the water is from the runoff from these places and the air quality, of course, that I mentioned. What we're trying to do is, is to alert the public that there's a lot of evidence out here to show that we just can't continue to do what we're doing and expect to be healthy. Mm -hmm. If we want to be healthy and we want to cut down the rate of cancer growth and the other health impacts, then we've got to change the way we're doing some of these things. Uh, and so being a, a, a public policy institute, what we're trying to do is to present to policymakers, legislators, others, local governments, here's the data, here's the science, here's the facts. Go to work. Now you decide what to do with all of this. Uh, you know, if, if on the one hand you say, we want people to be healthy, we want to have clean air, we want to have clean water. We want our kids in schools and, and playgrounds to have a healthy atmosphere. If you want that, then some other decisions have to be made on the other side of the ledger on how we're supporting and how we're uh, encouraging the, the kind of agriculture, the kind of animal feeding operations and things that we uh, have, uh, have engendered over the last, oh, maybe 30, 40 years. I want to go back to uh, the current U.S. Surgeon General, and Dr. Murthy, and your work in, in the labor area and his um, contribution to looking at the voice of the worker and how he was centered on thinking about that as we move forward. And it's one of the things that we, we navigate love that one, we want to have, you know, psychological safety for employees. We want to protect them from harm when it comes to, you know, their safety and security. We want to have opportunities for growth. We want to look at learning and accomplishment and how are we connecting those dots? And we look at that, uh, going back to the connection and community, um, and how he connected that social support and that sense of belonging in, inside business. Um, and, you know, work life harmony between life and the flexibility of all those things and, um, that we're working with in our daily lives. But then even more importantly is like mattering at work, like looking at, um, the meaning of work and my purpose behind that. And so thinking about all of that is a, he's a strong advocate of wellness and, and emphasizing mental health and that social connection, that emotional well-being. You've got to look at that and take a little bit of pride because the work that you've done to progress us to get there, where the U.S. Surgeon General says this is the framework, uh, you got to look at that with a little sense of pride, don't you? I'm going to make you if you don't. <laughs> no, I, I do. And, and I must say that one of the real positive joys that I've had in the last few years is seeing the movement of business. You know, in the past, business would say, okay, from eight to five or nine to five or whatever, that's it. Other than that, we don't care about you. Well, now businesses are beginning to do more and more in keeping, thinking about the health and the well-being of their employees and their families. 
this is a very positive development in America. And it's happened rather ra rapidly. I would say just in the last dozen years, this movement has been quite startling in a very nice way to see this happening out there. It's a change in the culture, but you're still caring for the for the groups that you're in. The, it's yes, a, it's yes. a cultural and a care mentality that businesses are bringing forth. And we talk about use business for good. We can engage in your culture. We can care for our people. Right. And um, yeah, that progress, especially over the last five to six years, has been something that we definitely have gravitated to as well. Yeah, I, I, it's it's one of the great positive developments of the last few years, and 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 I hope it continues. Uh, I I I have a feeling it will because I think from my reading uh, of it since I've been retired uh, is that the businesses that do think about the whole person and think about the person beyond just when they clock in and clock out are the most successful businesses. They have the highest productivity rate, the lowest turnover, the best profitable margins and things. And I might add one other element to this. We had an a, a Accenture study done back in 2015, 2016 in there. Accenture did a study of 140 different businesses that they, that were kind of alike in terms of size and what they did. And they divided them in terms of how aggressive they were in terms of hiring people with disabilities in competitive integrated employment. Now that's another kind of key set of words, competitive integrated employment. Sure. What they found over a period of several years that the companies that had a, a more aggressive approach to searching out, hiring people with disabilities, training people with disabilities, and putting them in competitive integrated employment, had higher profit margins, more income, less turnover. It, they just, they beat all the other companies. So again, we have developed uh, with, at the Institute in our disability division, a, a sort of a, a project or program called the value added benefit of hiring people with disabilities. It's not out of the goodness of your heart or something like that. It's not that it's, Hey, you want your business to be better? People with disabilities, if they're trained properly, will focus better. They're more loyal. They make fewer mistakes and your, and your productivity will go up. And so more and more, we're seeing businesses now thinking about, wait, there's a whole group of potential employees out there that we've missed. Absolutely. I think about my, about my father who walks into an interview at the Department of Transportation with, you know, a disability with having one arm. He wants to work at the Department of Transportation in the, in the graphics department. Um, imagine that interview back in 1978, whenever that was. That was a little different than today. but you know. Give, I don't know if my dad missed a day of work. You know, I, just, I, I don't know if he did. Um, and, and just like that learning and that accomplishment and that social support and that sense of belonging that was created for my father back at the Department of Transportation back then is, was amazing. And now you think about fast forwarding that today. Absolutely. The, the more that we can provide opportunities for folks, the better. Um, I think about the whole person quite a bit um, at Navigate. Um, we took a look at and listened to our employees. And one of the things that we learned was they just needed a little bit of time for their own self-care. And so this is going on uh, five years now where uh, three hours a week, you have three hours a week at Navigate to um, for your own self-care time. Um, we don't care what you do. We just put it on your calendar and um, let us know that you're using your self-care time. And um, we're not, you know, your 40 hour work week um, I've got my fingers in the air, um, <laughs> but you're not getting deducted. It's like you have three hours. And so that might be, you know, taking my daughter to school. That might be, you know, taking off Friday afternoon. That might be extending my lunch or doing something like that. But we have found, and we have been extremely blessed to be able to grow that we have over the last five years exponentially, we have the most productive folks. We have the 97% retention. We're a great place to work. And it wasn't because we gave them a product, we just listened to them and said, here's a benefit that we think that would help you. And that's just what we do. And so that, that time spent, we have 
benefited exponentially, right? Um, in productivity and retention, and and you know that's um, that to me is an opportunity for growth that we could potentially progress forward to is just giving people time back and saying there is not there, there's no such thing as work life work life balance in my estimation. There's just not, especially as a founder and an owner. <laughs> right. um, but there is work life harmony that we can you know help bring together, and, and if we press that forward. I mentioned my brother Frank. So we became a baker in Valley Junction at a bake shop called Tom's Bake Shop. So he'd get up at two o'clock in the morning, go do his baking stuff. And uh, this now is, uh, I'm talking about now, we're now in the 1950s. A man kept coming into the store in the morning and buy some rolls and stuff like that. And, and he started talking to my brother, but my brother said, I'm deaf. And so write it down. And so they began that kind of a communication. After a few months of this, this man said to my brother, you know, good, I like your rolls and stuff. And he said, uh, uh, how do you like being a baker? And my brother said, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and so this guy says, well, what would you want to do? He said, oh, I, I like to work with machines. I'm good at tool machines, and that's what I like to do. The guy said, well, that's my business. I own a business that does that. And he said, uh, now, I didn't know about this until later. Ten years later, I found this out. This man said, well, why don't you come work for me? Well, Frank took off his baker's cap and took off his apron, wanted to walk out the door with him. <laughs> well, the guy hired him. His name was Delavan, Mr. Delavan, and he owned a plant in West Wing called Delavan Manufacturing Company. It had been an old World War II uh, plant that did uh, things for uh, airplane engines and things. Now what they did is they made jet engine nozzles for jet engines, very fine thing, which is probably done by robotics now. So he hired my brother and he told his foreman, you know, put, put Frank to work. Well, now I'm going to fast forward 10 years. I'm now out of high school. I'm now out of college. I'm in the Navy. I come home for Christmas. Now, my brother never got married. I wasn't married then. And every year, Delavan would have a Christmas party for all of his workers. So Frank asked me to go with him. I said, sure. So I went with him and big layout for a Christmas party, dinner, fantastic what Delavan did for the workers and their families. And then at the end of this, Mr. Delavan took the stage. Now, mind you, I've never met this guy. And he's up on the platform thanking everybody for a great year and have a Merry Christmas. And that. Oh, and he said, and I want Frank Harkin to come up here. I'm sitting next to Frank. I said, he wants you up there. Frank was, so I said, go on up. So Frank goes up to the stage and Delvin tells this story. He said, you know, I hired Frank Harkin 10 years ago. He's been here 10 years now at Delvin. And in 10 years, he hasn't missed one day of work and hasn't been late once. And all of his productivity has been better than just about anybody's. He never makes mistakes puts parts out. And so he gave him a nice gold watch. It's fantastic. Fantastic. So I went up to meet Delavan. That's some brother pride there. Like you got brothers got to be, you got to be able to have a little brother pride right there. <laughs> so I went up to meet Mr. Delavan. Told him I was Frank's brother. And so he told me this story about him meeting him 10 years before and hiring him. He said, so I took him down to my plant and I told my forward foreman, put him to work doing something, find out what he can do. He said, I hired your brother just out of the goodness of my heart. He's a nice guy. I really like him. He said, a few months later, I came and foreman was, I said, what, what do you got Harkin doing? And the foreman said, well, I put him on this very intricate machine. I did a couple of things and he proved he could do it. And this was a machine that you had to wear like uh, magnifying goggles and stuff because they drilled little holes in jet engine nozzle for Pratt and Whitney in General Electric. And he said, the guy's fan. And the, and the foreman said, the guy's fantastic. He never makes mistakes, puts more parts out for Shows up always on time, cleans up his workplace when he leaves. He said, the guy's great. So Delavan tells me this. He says, now, I was very curious about this. And so we started observing your brother at work. And we discovered something. This was a very noisy place. A lot of drills and bells and clanging and people yelling. It was just very noisy. 
your brother never heard a word. He just sat. He just stood there in his workspace and did his job. Mm. Mr. Delavan told me, he said, you know what? A couple, three years later, I figured it out. So I went out and hired more deaf people. <laughs> <laughs> they were better for my bottom line. Now, I tell you that story because and then years later, working on the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title I, I made sure that Title I of that bill was employment. Mm. The other thing, Title I's employment, because I figured that was the most important, to make sure that people with disabilities had employment so they could live independently, so they could have full participation and equal opportunity. And, uh, and so I often thought about that with my brother Frank, that how many more people out there with disabilities that can do great things, but they're never given the opportunity. Just give the opportunity. Just give them the opportunity. Yeah. So we do a closing segment called Best Day Ever. I happen to wear vests like my dad um, wears a vest almost every day. And so we call it Best Day Ever. And this is just um, something, share something good that's happened in your life or something that you're proud of recently. And your wife wrote an amazing book that's out there right now. That could be it. Or what's a good Senator Harkin that maybe that you'd like to share with the, with everybody? First of all, I always remember this refrain uh, that, you know, whenever I'm feeling down, I take a look out the wind. I, I look out the window and take a look around. I don't know why that's always stuck with me. Um, it comes from some kid's show or something. Anyway, the idea being, if you're feeling that, just look around nature. Take a look. Even if it's raining and stormy, there's fantastic things happening out there. So I always thought, whenever I'm down, just stick your head out the window, take a look around. Don't just look at yourself. Now, best things that's happened to me, you mentioned my wife's book. She just came out with it. It's wonderful. All her life, she's been writing short stories about people and places and things, not fiction. And so she put them all together thinking she was just going to do this for our kids and grandkids. And someone said, well, you know, I think maybe other people might like to read these. And so she just came out with it and it's been a lot of fun. And, and, uh, and here's the joke on me, because there's some stories in there about me. It made me don't show me in the best light, <laughs> but, but yeah, I ran for president once, 1992. It was a very short campaign. I obviously didn't make it. And so Ruth wrote about this. My wife wrote about this. So here's the title of the book. When my husband ran for president and other short stories. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good lead. So, so uh, that makes me feel good, <laughs> just in an odd way. Matt, what do you got? My son is 23. He's uh, just graduated college. He's looking forward to the next phase of his career. Wants to be a physician assistant. He's been doing a lot of uh, clinical work and he told me the story recently. He was at a community health clinic. He's done a lot of that. And you've, if you've been to a medical appointment recently, you know, half the time the person you're talking to is tapping on a laptop, right? There's always a lot of uh, technology involved. And a woman came in who had been through some serious trauma. She closed the laptop and he just listened. Good job, dad. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Can we keep him in the state of Iowa? <laughs> Let's, we, we, we need, we He's need in New York city, right? We, we need, we need, we need to, well, we need to get him into Iowa. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Both of you. Um, I, my good is the fact that, um, sincerely I get across, I get to sit across the table with you, Senator Arkin and say, thank you. Um, thank you for the work that you did in the space of disabilities, healthcare, labor, um, uh, kids and nutrition, um, funding, um, you know, research when it comes to health. Um, I consider you one of Iowa's greatest natural resources. And um, a lot of us have learned from you and we're gonna um, continue to progress wellness and prevention and healthcare and the built environment and disability rights um, as we move forward. And um, you made an impact on my life, my family's life. And um, that's my best day ever because I get to say thank you. So thank you for taking the time to being with us. Uh, Matt, thank you for being here and all the work you're continually doing. Um, everybody that's out there listening, um, thank you for uh, being part of this podcast today. And thank you for listening in. Continue to like and subscribe and uh, we'll see you soon. 
See everybody. Bye-bye.